Hello everyone and welcome back to the Film Feast Watches 007. My name is Sam Donches and I have been gone for a really, really long time. And this series has been on hiatus for a really, really long time. But I want to bring it back and I want to finish it because maybe, just maybe, down the road, I'll bring the channel back in full force. But I can't do that if the Film Feast Watches 007 isn't finished. We're going to get there in due time, but first... Let me catch you up to speed. So back in 2015, I had only watched a handful of Bond movies up until that point. Some of the Brosnans, some of the Craigs, but really didn't have a good foundational understanding of the character or the franchise or even the espionage spy genre at large. And look, I know the Bond films are not representative of spy movies or espionage in general. They're more just like heroism in the form of Western... UK imperialism. Look, we'll get into those details later, but like I was saying, I watched all of the Bond films from Dr. No onward. I'm happy that I've gotten to this point because now I'm in a lot more familiar territory, like with child Sam self, and there's a lot to talk about in today's episode, which is why I'm only talking about one movie, and that movie is Goldeneye. Ah, yes, we finally made it. I had never seen this movie up until 2015, which is surprising because of how much I played the famous Nintendo 64 video game. There are just so many charming things about that video game. The blocky character models and the music. Oh God, the music. The N64 game's music was better than Eric Serra's score for GoldenEye the 1995 movie. And that might come as a little controversial, but the music in this scene... I enjoy a spirited ride as much as the next girl. Maybe. Who's that? The next girl. understand why you would write that music for a scene like that. Like, I get it. It's a playful scene, but that's 290s, man. <laughs> get it out of here. Which, happily, I can say is some of the only business in this movie that doesn't work, because by and large, I think it's a very successful film, and I feel comfortable saying it right now, that it's one of my favorite James Bond movies, and nostalgia surprisingly plays a very small part in that. And because that nostalgia is only rooted in the video game, which I actually did a pretty recent rewatch of a playthrough of the video game, and it's pretty dissimilar from the movie. There's a lot of things that happen in the storyline of that video game that does not happen in the film. The video game is at its best when it is mimicking moments from the movie, like the watch cutting open the panel in the floor on the train. That's great stuff. But past that, it's a completely different object. The one thing I really like about Eric Serra's score is that bell chime, which is used frequently throughout the movie. And I think it sets it apart from every other James Bond score, which is why I like Grant Kirkhope's score so much more for the Nintendo 64 game, because that bell chime is just used on and on and on and on. And those songs are so much more fast and exciting and unique. And this is the guy that did the Banjo-Kazooie score, so it makes sense. All right, I think I've spent enough time talking about the ancillary stuff, but let's now talk about this James Bond. You know him, you love him. His name is Pierce Brosnan. The name's Bond, James Bond. Brosnan was actually supposed to come in as Bond back in the 80s, but due to scheduling conflicts with the very well-known show at the time, Remington Steel, he couldn't, and the role went to Timothy Dalton, as we all know. And as Dalton took the series out of the 80s, the films kind of struggled to come together in the early 90s. GoldenEye was actually supposed to be Timothy Dalton's third James Bond film, but a lot of things happened in that interim period. As the 80s were coming to an end, the Cold War was coming to an end, and there were a lot of geopolitical things happening in the script of GoldenEye that were needing to be rewritten and reshifted around. And that's actually, you know, the crux of GoldenEye, which is what I think makes it such a good and long lasting Bond movie is because it is so geopolitically rich. There were also director change-ups and Albert Broccoli couldn't find the right person to bring in to direct this third Dalton Bond movie. 
and it just never came together. Obviously, Brosnan had a pretty solid career in the late 80s and early 90s. We all know that he was in Mrs. Doubtfire. Oh, this must be the famous Mrs. Doubtfire. It's a pleasure to meet you. Oh. Uh, yes, well, uh, Miranda's been raving about you. Odd. She's never mentioned you. No. The 90s also saw Albert Broccoli's health deteriorating pretty rapidly. He died seven months after Goldeneye came out. He handed over the reins to his daughter, Barbara, who pretty much had the fixed idea of Pierce Brosnan succeeding Dalton as James Bond. And I think for many people my age, Brosnan embodies Bond. He may not be the best Bond, but he is kind of, in a way, our Bond. If you were a casual moviegoer like I was, more than likely Brosnan was the first Bond you went to the theater to see. And like I said, they went through several directors before they finally came down to Martin Campbell. Even John Woo was considered at one point. But ultimately, Martin Campbell is who he got, and I think he's one of the better Bond directors. Obviously, he goes on to direct the remake of Casino Royale. He's an extremely accomplished director in general, and whether or not you like some of his other movies, like Green Lantern, he's still a good director. Like, he's a good journeyman director. Vertical Limit sucks, and yes, Green Lantern sucks, and The Foreigner's not that good, and he has a new one with Liam Neeson out right now called Mem uh, Memory. But let's just go through his filmography real quick. The Mask of Zorro? Holy shit! What a film. The Legend of Zorro, obviously the sequel. Didn't see it. I don't know what Beyond Borders is. Oh, pfft. it's an Angelina Jolie movie about aid workers in Africa. Edge of Darkness, which is actually a remake of a British series that Martin Campbell did back in the 80s. Oh, it's starring Mel Gibson. Not interested. And really, right off the bat, we have to talk about Martin Campbell's direction. It is so immediately different from anything else we've seen in a James Bond movie before. The cuts are quick and dynamic, and they only show the details that we need to see. Campbell's direction is so economic as well. Not a single moment feels wasted. Working with Martin Campbell was very exciting. He is a filmmaker, the way he tells a story was exhilarating to work on, because you'll come across a 15-page scene, an action sequence, which starts here with Bond coming in the door, shoots two guys, goes down the corridor, and he shot it absolutely in sequence. So from an actor's point of view, it was magnificent. And what's even better about this sequence is that we never really get a good look at Brosnan's face until he's upside down looking at a dude on the shedder. Beg your pardon? Forgot to knock. It's great. Another fresh element that GoldenEye is bringing into the mix is that it's the first time that James teams up with another 00 agent. And in this case, it's Agent 006, Alec Trevelyan. Played by the one, the only, Sean Bean. He had number of his dog. Good you bash I'm alone. Aren't we all? Ah, fuck, that's such a great dialogue exchange. Alec and James's mission doesn't go according to plan. Alec is killed by the Russians. For England, James! And James has to escape. Apart from some aged green screen stuff, this is still a phenomenal sequence of James jumping off of the ledge on the motorcycle jumping into the airplane and then pulling up. Totally impossible shit, but we love it. There's some great miniature work of the Russian base blowing up, and in general, there's a lot of great miniature work throughout this movie. No big deal, just another amazing craft that's gone by the wayside in favor of overworked, underpaid, non-unionized CGI visual effects artists. And then we get the title sequence with a song done by the great Tina Turner. Oddly, one of the weirder title sequences, though. I don't mind the song whatsoever, but just some of the images in this are strange. And I don't want to nitpick because some of this imagery alludes to stuff that we see later on in the film showing a very broken Soviet nation with this new Russia and the previous, you know, fallen USSR. The hammer and sickle meant something. It wasn't this this vision of oppression just because the Western imperialism made it so... Uh, I don't know, man. I don't know. I don't want to 
bring my politics in too soon because the the I mean we're gonna get there. Famke Jensen opens up her mouth and then a gun pops out. It's weird. It's weird. And then we have the winding cliffside race that I was talking about earlier. Weird Eric Sarah score choices. You know, I, I, but it's still a fun sequence. And really, like I said, the goofy stuff has gotten out of the way pretty early. James is in the middle of a review set up by the new M, who we all know is played by the incomparable Judy Dench, now Dame Judy Dench. She goes on to play M for several other films and really just kills it. You know, I think she is the M. And that's no knock against Bernard Lee or Ray Fiennes or any of the other lesser known M's, but Judy Dench just does that shit. She's the best. I'd argue she has one of the best scenes as an M in the entire franchise in this single moment. You don't like me, Bond. You don't like my methods. You think I'm an accountant. A bean counter more interested in my numbers and your instincts. The thought had occurred to me. Good. Because I think you're a sexist, misogynist dinosaur. A relic of the Cold War, whose boyish charms, though wasted on me, obviously appeal to that young woman I sent out to evaluate you. Point taken. Not quite, 007. If you think for one moment I don't have the balls to send a man out to die, your instincts are dead wrong. I've no compunction about sending you to your death. But I won't do it on a whim, even with your cavalier attitude towards life. There is a clear kind of line of conflict set up about James's attitude towards women in the workplace at large and just also his dynamic with women in general. We see this repeated with M and Moneypenny and Natalia and even Zinnia in a way who I think kind of portrays the best version of women sticking it to Bond. Zinnia on a top is played by Famke Jensen. Okay, <laughs> God, that name. Oh, I know that these that these movies and these stories are in on the joke, but Zinnia on a top. Fuck. It's just, it's so funny. It's it's funny. It's funny. It's funny because she's on the top. She fucking, she's got the strap. But if you've seen any of the Taken movies or almost any of the X-Men movies, you know Famke Jensen. I have to say some really absurd lines in this movie. And I have to do some really absurd things. And I think that if you start taking everything very seriously, then you're just in trouble. So I just tried to have as much fun as I could with it. You know, not take this character too seriously. Realize that what kind of genre movie I was in and that, um, you know, I'm playing a sort of a cartoon-esque character. I like this scene at the Baccarat table because it obviously mirrors that scene in Dr. No that has been redone time and time again in subsequent Bond films, but it's just so nice to see Pierce Brosnan in this setting. James gets his mission statement from Moneypenny to follow Zinnia because she's connected to the Yanis Corporation. Current suspected links to the Yanis Crime Syndicate, St. Petersburg. Yacht Manticore is leased to a known Yanis corporate front. M authorizes you to observe Miss Onatop, but stipulates no contact without prior approval. End transmission, Money Penny. Bond fails to nab Zinnia before she steals an experimental helicopter, which she then takes to the Severnaya Space Weapons Control Center in Russia. This is where things get kicked into a higher gear because General Oromov is back, the baddie from the beginning of the movie. We meet Boris, who's played by Alan Cumming. I am invincible! Who is such a fucking dirtbag in this movie. All right, I'll give you a hint. They're right in front of you and can open very large doors. Such a geek. We also meet Natalia, who is played by Isabella Skoripko. She is the main Bond girl of this film, and she's one of my favorite Bond girls. I think she holds her own against Pierce Brosnan so well, and I think that she's just very well written. Oh, stop it, both of you! Stop it! You're like boys with toys. Back at MI6 headquarters, which, hold on, hold on, hold on, stop the presses. This is, I think, the first time that we get a proper establishing shot of MI6, and this goes on to be the MI6 headquarters location up until Skyfall. And we know what happened there, don't we? We'll talk about it when we get to Skyfall. We get a new money penny played by Samantha Bond. What would I ever do without you? As far as I can remember, James, you've never had me. Hope springs eternal. You know, this sort of behavior could qualify as sexual harassment. Really? What's the penalty for that? 
Someday you have to make good on your innuendos. We also meet a new Bill Tanner, played by Michael Kitchen. We get another great Q scene. Here he's still played by Desmond Lewin. A pen. This is a class four grenade. Three clicks, arms the four second fuse, another three disarms it. How long did you say the fuse was? Oh, grow up. 007. They all said the pen was mightier than the sword. Well, thanks to me, they were right. And then it's back to Russia for Bond where he meets Jack Wade of the CIA, played by Joe Don Baker. I guess this is supposed to be the new Felix Leiter because Felix Leiter in this universe was eaten half to death by a shark, so okay. I think Joe Don Baker is pretty funny. He plays that overblown American stereotype pretty well. It's well, this baby hasn't let me down yet. She's like a little bitch, but she gets you there. Americans are going to see these movies, so I guess the American government has to have some foothold in them. Even the casual Bond fans will recognize Joe Don Baker as Brad Whitaker from The Living Daylights, only two Bond films prior to this. But what they might not know is that Joe Don Baker worked with Martin Campbell on his Edge of Darkness television series. Jack Wade leads Bond to Valentine, who Bond has some prior experience with, although never seen in any previous film. Here he's played by Robbie Coltrane, who... It's fucking Hagrid. Free market economy, I swear it will be the end of me. Walther PPK. 7.65 millimeter. Only three men I know use such a gun. I believe I've killed two of them. Lucky me. And oh shit! Mini Driver, what is she doing here? She gets a bit rolled, but it's pretty funny. That is Irina, my mistress. Time to go. Irina! Take a hike! After a pretty intense encounter, Bond finally gets some intel from Valentine about Yanis. These are not just criminals, Valentine. They're traitors. What do you expect from a Cossack? Who? It's Yanis. I never met the man, but I know he's Ilyen's Cossack. Group the work for the Nazis against the Russians. See, th this is where I could get into talking about some stuff, but I'm going to put a pin in it just for this moment because it's a pretty interesting wrinkle in this film's grander storyline. First, I have to talk about that steam room fight, which I think it's obviously one of the more uh, iconic Bond fight slash sex sequences. I think it's also the most outright sex scene in a Bond movie because it's not a sex scene, but there are sexual overtones in it. <laughs> But one thing I want to highlight here is just how good Pierce Brosnan is at conveying pain. I think he does it better than any other James Bond ever that includes Daniel Craig. He just knows how to express pain in a very specific way that I'm just like, oh shit, Bond is getting his ass handed to him in this scene. Oh god! Zinnia leads James to Yanis in this amazing Soviet graveyard of fallen, broken statues, which is one of the greatest sequences in this film, if not just for its action, which is pretty sparse, but for its atmosphere. And just like at the beginning of the film, Alex steps out of the shadows. Sean Bean is back. The former double O agent has turned away from Her Majesty's Secret Service and is now this stirrer of pots, this man who wants to control the world through bringing other nations to its knees. Alec is revealed to be a Lian's Cossack, which were a real-life group of Cossacks who fled Russia in the early days of the Bolshevik Revolution. There was famine, there was violence, there was a lot happening during that period, a lot of which has been distorted by Western media. During World War II, which the Cossacks aided the Nazis in, they wanted to flee to the US and to the UK, but the British soldiers basically turned on them, sending them back to Russia to be repatriated. And in this repatriating process, they were put into camps and killed. Now, I've done a little bit of reading, and I can only stress a little bit of reading. It seems more like in the specific Lian's Cossack situation, 
they were more brutalized by the British soldiers and not by the Soviets. Now, this could be a clear line in on why Alec wants revenge on James and what he stands for specifically, but the waters get even more muddied. See, it's specified in the dialogue that the Soviets were the ones that, you know, brutalized and murdered the Leon's Cossacks. Sent them back to Stalin, who promptly had them all shot. Women, children, families. Which I don't think is necessarily all that true. And I mean, this gets back to why did the Cossacks turn away from communism in the first place? Big, complex issues. I could go down a whole rabbit hole talking about this, but I don't want to derail this episode, which is about Goldeneye, a very good movie. Still, ruthless people. They got what they deserved. But that's just something for y'all to ruminate on. I still think Alec Trevelyan is one of the most realistic and to some extent one of the most sympathetic villains in the Bond canon. How did the MI6 screening miss that your parents were Leon's Cossacks? Once again, your faith is misplaced. They knew. We're both orphans, James. But where your parents had the luxury of dying in a climbing accident. Mine survived the British betrayal and Stalin's execution squads. But my father couldn't let himself or my mother live with the shame of it. And my six figured I was too young to remember. And in one of life's little ironies, the son went to work for the government whose betrayal caused the father to kill himself and his wife. Hence, Janus. Two-faced Roman God come to life. It wasn't God who gave me this face. It was you setting the timers for three minutes instead of six. Am I supposed to feel sorry for you? No. You're supposed to die for me. <laughs> oh, by the way, I did think of asking you to join my little scheme, but somehow I knew 007's loyalty was always to the mission, never to his friend. Anyways, there's a convoluted death trap where Bond and Natalia are placed in the cockpit of the helicopter and they have to get out. And then the whole cockpit actually launches out of the helicopter. Seems like a very weird ejection process. Bond and Natalia are then captured by the Russian army and taken to a holding cell where they're questioned by Defense Minister Mishkin. And like Bond goes like full Seinfeld here. By what means shall we execute you, Commander Bond? What, no small talk? No chit-chat? That's the trouble with the world today. No one takes the time to do a really sinister interrogation anymore. It's a lost art. Your sense of humor just slay me, Commander. I'm sorry. Then there's this great chase sequence through these archives, which leads out into the streets of Russia. Bond steals a tank and blows all this shit up. It's, it's one of the more fantastic sequences in the film. tracks General Oromov and the captive Natalia to Yanis's train, which is such a cool design. The sequence comes to a head. Alec is being super skeevy with Natalia, which kind of weirdly seems out of character, but whatever. You know, James and I shared everything. Absolutely everything. To the victor go the spoil. The train is going down the tracks, Bond appears in the tank out of fucking nowhere and derails the train, gets Natalia out, does the watch thing with the panel in the floor. They find out where Yanis and Zinnia are flying off to. Cuba. We love Cuba, don't we? Trading one form of communism for another. So, you're looking for a dish the size of a football field, huh? Doesn't exist. You can't light a cigar in Cuba without us seeing it. I know it's there. It's a duplicate of Sievernaya, like your secret transmitters in New Zealand. I've never been in New Zealand. There's a great confrontation between James and Natalia on the beach. You think I'm impressed? All of you with your guns, your killing, your death, for what? So you can be a hero? All the heroes I know are dead. Natalia, listen to me. How can you act like this? Although I don't like those 90s kisses where it's like, we're fighting at first, but it's it's okay because we're passionate people, and it's it's 
it doesn't work anymore. Bond and Natalia take a plane to try and find what is essentially a remade version of the Severnaya Space Weapons Control Center. And as they make another pass around the coordinates where they swore the location was at, they are shot out of the sky by a lake missile. And then finally we get the final confrontation with Xenia, which was such a difficult boss battle in the 90s for me as a kid in the N64 game. I had a really hard time with that and people will probably make fun of me for that because it really wasn't that hard. But she's in Huntress mode. She's like fully ready to kill James in this moment, but obviously he gets the upper hand. We have to talk about this final set piece. The weapons control center lifts out of the lake and it's this huge set. Alan Cumming gets some great moments here. This is not one of your games, Boris. Real people will die, you pathetic little worm. She was in the mainframe. Check the computer. She's a moron. A second level programmer. She works on the guidance system. She doesn't even have access to the firing codes. Speak to me! I don't think I've actually taken the opportunity in this episode yet to talk about what the GoldenEye is. Obviously, GoldenEye was the name of Ian Fleming's estate in Jamaica where he wrote all of the Bond novels, but in this film, GoldenEye is a weapon in space that can emit an EMP that, you know, can take the power out and all that stuff, you know, take huge electricity grids out, weapon systems out, everything out. We see it throughout the movie. It's a very dangerous thing, but in the mid 90s, it was, I guess, a fairly new thing for moviegoers at least. But then it was popularized more in the Matrix films, I'd say. Bond and Natalia are able to compromise this GoldenEye system and it starts falling out of orbit. What the hell's happening? You have re-entry in 12 minutes. It will burn up somewhere over the Atlantic. Deal with it. She changed the access codes. Then she can fix it. Alec has more or less lost at this point, so he's just trying to kill James. And it is such a well done sequence. Everything about it is beautifully done. You know, James? I was always better. This final sequence over the satellite dish was apparently part of the last days of shooting, and appropriately so. Brosnan described how close he and Sean Bean had become over the six months of shooting, and you really do feel that in this sequence particularly. For England, James? No. For me. Sean Bean dies twice! That's how big this movie is! And of course, Boris gets his comeuppance. Yes! I am invincible! Bond and Natalia escape the exploding weapon center. I assume the golden eye falls out of orbit and crashes in the ocean somewhere. It will burn up somewhere over the Atlantic. And then they're rescued by the Marines. Movie over. Look, this is my first time in a really long time talking on camera, and I do hope I was able to convey my love for this film in a clear way because 
It's one of my favorite Bond films. I think it's objectively one of the best Bond films. I think Martin Campbell's direction is so exciting and brings such a fresh take to this franchise that really we don't see again until Martin Campbell comes back to do Casino Royale. I also think politically it cements itself in such an important place in real life world events post Cold War, post Berlin Wall coming down. It's all there in the meta text of this movie. You just have to be aware enough to see it. Obviously this is still through a western narrative lens so you have to get past that but I still think that there are things of value to be gleaned from Goldeneye. And I'm not just talking about bad fat jokes. For an ex-KGB agent you surprised me Valentine. And surely someone of your stature must have realized the skill was not to hit your knee but to uh, miss the rest of you. I think that Bond's relationship to women in this film specifically doesn't really get much better than this, up until No Time to Die at least. Bond is, for the first time in his career, being held accountable, and that's really refreshing to see. And this was especially surprising because I hadn't seen this Brosnan film. I had only seen Tomorrow Never Dies, The World Is Not Enough, and Die Another Day. So finally coming back around and watching Goldeneye and understanding okay, this is what they had to say at the time about this character and about this dynamic between men and women. And it's never really touched upon again in the Brosnan films and in many of the Craig films. And maybe that's not the reason that you go to see a James Bond film, but maybe you should do some reflection and realize that uh, you suck. The best Bond films are great, not necessarily because the story is great or because the action is great. Yes, those are obviously two very important things, but the themes, the themes being good in a Bond film is super rare to see. And I think Goldeneye has that in spades. I think it's a good movie, and I think uh, if you haven't watched it in a while, you should, you should give it a watch. It's streaming on Amazon Prime. It's also on physical media in various forms. Physical media rules. You should always invest in physical media. Anyways, that's it for me. I'm gonna get off my soapbox. Thank you guys so much for watching. It's been so good to finally come back to Bond. I can't wait to finish this series. Next episode's gonna be about the final three Brosnan films. I'm gonna try and just get through it all in one go. I don't know when that episode's gonna hit. I don't even know when this episode's gonna hit. I don't know when I'm gonna be able to do any of these other episodes. It could be a couple months, could be a couple years. I definitely don't want it to be a couple of years, but that's that's just the reality of certain things these days but again thank y'all so much for watching it's been an honor coming back to this series and i'm just super happy that people paid attention in the first place bye